Okay, well, I'm Alan Levine, and together with Tom Merrill here, I run the Political Theory Institute here at AU, the uh, host of this evening's talk. I just want to quickly mention we have two other talks coming up this semester. On October 26, we have Tara Isabella Burton, uh, a writer and novelist, talking about self-made, creating our identities from Da Vinci to the Kardashians. So we're really bringing it up today. Um, and on November 30th, we have Diana Schaub uh, also talking about Lincoln, Lincoln's Lyceum Address, Democratic Theory for Citizens. Uh, today, we are very privileged to have with us Professor Jim Reed, who teaches in political science department at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University in Minnesota. He's the author of four books. Uh, the most recent one is this one, The Sovereign of a Free People, Abraham Lincoln, Majority Rule and Slavery, on which he's gonna be uh, drawing for tonight's talk. He lives in Avon, Minnesota, where he chairs the city's planning commission. He received his BA from the University of Chicago and his PhD from Harvard. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jim. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. Talking about sovereign of a free people, Abraham Lincoln. I want to thank Alan Levine for inviting me to give this presentation, Ayanna, uh, and uh, to Tom Merrill and Sunyata Curry for coordinating the Lincoln Scholars Program at American University. Also to Sunyata for helping for the logistics with my visit and presentation. Thank you to the students who participated in the 4 p.m. seminar today. You had great uh, observations and questions. And thank you to all of you here for my presentation today, both those of you who are in the room and those who may be remoting into this. And I look forward to your questions and ideas and responses. The title of my talk is Sovereign of a Free People, Abraham Lincoln on Respecting Election Results. The main title comes from Lincoln's first inaugural address, March 4th, 1861, where he described rule by a deliberate, constitutionally restrained majority as, quote, the only true sovereign of a free people. Lincoln's passage defending majority rule in the first inaugural address is often quoted, but rarely examined in much depth. I will argue that Lincoln had thought carefully about majority rule, its promise, its limitations, its capacity for both achieving justice and inflicting injustice, and its superiority to any other way of governing a free and just society. Most importantly, amid the political crisis during which Lincoln gave his first inaugural address, Lincoln believed and hoped that peaceful majority rule, decision-making through, quote, time, discussion, and the ballot box, as he phrased it, was capable of addressing, of peacefully addressing, addressing even the most difficult political issues, like the future of slavery in the United States. So go to slide three here. Okay. In contrast, the preemptive secession of seven slave states in response to Lincoln's election, these seven, um, before he had even taken office, represented in Lincoln's view, the rejection of peaceful majority rule rejection by a powerful privileged minority who severed the union and threatened violence, bullets, when they failed to get their way through ballots in a fair election. The second part of my title, Abraham Lincoln on Respecting Election Results, is a deliberate effort to change how we typically think about the outbreak of the American Civil War and what was at stake in that war. What caused the Civil War? There was, of course, the old lost cause fable that the war was not about slavery at all, that the Southern states simply wanted to be left alone, that they would have abolished slavery on their own if it weren't for the Northerners' ruthless aggression toward their states' rights. I won't say much about this old argument, except that it does not remotely fit the facts. To defend and perpetuate slavery was the principal reason the slave states seceded from the Union especially the seven states that seceded before Lincoln had even taken office. South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. 
Secessionists were willing to risk civil war to prevent even a gradual democratic constitution respecting phase out of slavery over several decades, which was Lincoln's original hope. A much more serious and plausible line of argument is the opposite, that slavery was so deeply entrenched, so expansive, so aggressive, that civil war over slavery was inevitable in the United States. And that furthermore, that civil war was the only way in which slavery could have been abolished in the United States. This view appears to have the historical record on its side because we know that historically slavery was abolished through mass violence in the United States, not through peaceful democratic means. To suggest that any other path to slavery's extinction was possible requires an exercise of counterfactual imagination. Many of those who argue that slavery could only have been extinguished through mass violence also argue that it was more or less inevitable that Lincoln's election or the election of any anti-slavery president would trigger secession and civil war. From this point of view, it would make no difference whether slave states seceded before Lincoln took office or waited until he had actually taken some anti-slavery action. The result would have been the same in any case secession followed by civil war. From this point of view then, it made no difference whatsoever whether the triggering event of the civil war was an election or something else. I will argue on the contrary that the triggering event, slave states unwillingness to accept election results that did not go their way was of enormous importance in shaping the way the contest over slavery played out. It was also critically important in shaping Lincoln's own interpretation of the meaning of the Civil War as putting to the test, as he phrased it in his Gettysburg Address, whether, quote, government of the people, by the people, for the people would or would not perish from the earth. There's no question that slavery was the principal cause of the American Civil War. Slavery had been a festering, unresolved issue since the earliest years of the American Republic. But it did make a difference that the immediate trigger, the spark that ignited this long accumulated fuel was slaveholders' refusal to accept the results of a free and fair presidential election that did not go their way. If slaveholders preferred candidate, John Breckinridge had won the election, those same slave states would have remained in the union and demanded that the free states respect the election results. In this sense, it made an important and enduring difference that the triggering event of the Civil War was a powerful but outvoted minority's refusal to play by the democratic election rules that up till then all major players had been willing to accept. I do not positively claim that slavery could have been abolished in the United States through the kind of gradual, peaceful, democratic squeeze that Lincoln envis envisioned. Those who argue that civil war over slavery was inevitable might in the end be right. But I do maintain that it's impossible to, under, to fully understand Lincoln's political thought without taking into account that he believed slavery could have been and should have been peacefully and democratically abolished through the regular methods of time, discussion, and ballot box. Equally important, I will argue that the principal motivation behind preemptive secession in other words, secession simply in response to Lincoln's election before he had taken office, was that secessionists themselves believed that Lincoln's scenario of extinguishing slavery through a long, slow majoritarian squeeze was very realistic and likely to succeed in the long run, if not immediately and forcefully rejected. That rejection, secessionist beliefs, had to begin by dramatically rejecting, rejecting the legitimacy of Lincoln's election. For if slave states accepted Lincoln as a legitimate president, making anti-slavery statements that could be printed even in the South, appointing military officers and postmasters and customs collectors, even in the heart of the slaveholding states. In short, if his election was treated as normal and legitimate, then the corner would be turned and public opinion would begin to shift against slavery, even among some non-slaveholding white Southerners. Slavery would be on the route to a long slow extinction at the hands of a principally Northern majority over the course of several decades. 
preemptive secession, dramatically refusing any longer to play by the shared democratic rules, was designed to prevent this first step down the road to slavery's ultimate extinction. Because I've argued that the specific triggering event of the Civil War, breaking the election rules, was of enduring importance, I will give some background on that election. I will then discuss the theme of majority rule and respecting election results in Lincoln's first inaugural address. So go to slide four. Lincoln was elected in 1860 in a deeply divided four-way presidential race. No one disputed that he had won a procedurally fair vote according to the constitutional rules. Slave state leaders did not claim, for instance, that million, millions of fugitive slaves had illegally voted in Northern states. Lincoln secured a 59% electoral vote majority, 180 out of 303, though he received only a plurality, just under 40% of the popular vote. But the same was true for his predecessor, James Buchanan, who was elected in 1856 with a 59% electoral college majority, the bulk of his support coming from slave states, but only a 45% popular vote plurality in the three-way contest. So slide five is the 1856 election. Lincoln was disappointed in 1856 that the anti-immigrant American party, also known as the Know Nothings, had split the anti-slavery vote and allowed Buchanan, a very pro-slavery northerner, to win with 45% of the popular vote. But neither Lincoln nor his party disputed the legitimacy of Buchanan's election. So slide six is the 1860 election. Thus, the mere fact that Lincoln received less than half of the popular votes in 1860 was not the rationale for secession. Much more important for justifying secession was where Lincoln's votes came from, almost entirely from northern free states, and that he held what slaveholders regarded as unconstitutional policy aims, banning slavery in federal territories, not yet states, with the long-term goal of extinguishing slavery everywhere. Who the other three candidates were and wh where they stood on slavery is also important for understanding Lincoln's defensive majority rule in his first inaugural address. Coming in second in the electoral college with 72 electoral votes, 24%, but a distant third with only 18% of the popular vote was the slaveholders most preferred candidate John Breckinridge, who took the position that slavery must be legal in every federal territory. That was also the stance of Chief Justice Roger Taney's opinion for the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott decision. Given Breckinridge's 18% in the 1860 election, this indicates the strongly anti-majoritarian character of the Dred Scott ruling. Don Breckinridge was one of two Democratic candidates in 1860, the result of the Democratic Party's fateful internal divisions over slavery. Breckinridge was dubbed the state's rights Democratic Party candidate. The regular Democratic Party candidate in 1860 was Lincoln's longtime Illinois rival and 1858 US Senate uh, opponent, Stephen Douglas. Douglas came in second in the popular vote with 30%, but a distant fourth in the electoral college with only 12 votes. Douglas's campaign was crippled from the outset because the delegates from the slave states of the lower South, the same ones that pre preemptively seceded from the Union, walked out of the 1860 Democratic Convention in Charleston, South Carolina, rather than accept Stephen Douglas. Go to slide seven now. I'm, this is going to uh, go back to give you backstory on Stephen Douglas and slavery. The reason for the slave state's rejection of Douglas in 1860 is important for understanding this deeply divided election and its aftermath. Stephen Douglas had been the author of the 1854 Kansas-Nebraska Act, which repealed the Missouri Compromise restriction on the northward expansion of slavery. Douglas's position was that the inhabitants or more precisely, the white inhabitants, should decide by majority vote whether to permit or prohibit slavery in a territory. 
everyone assumed that if slavery was prohibited in territory at the early stages, that it would likely enter the Union as a free state. And if slavery was introduced into a territory at the early stages, it would be very difficult to remove. And that territory was likely to enter the Union as a new slave state. In 1854, the federal territories, not yet states, covered nearly half of the continental United States, the seedbed of 17 future states. So there was a lot at stake with respect to the political contest over slavery in the territories. But Stephen Douglas believed that this whole contest could be resolved by allowing the white inhabitants of each territory to decide the slavery question. In this sense, both Lincoln and Douglas would appear to be principled advocates of majority rule. Lincoln favoring national majorities and <clears throat> Douglas local majorities. Lincoln did not view Douglas as a principled advocate of majority rule, however. Most obviously for Lincoln, white people deciding by majority vote to enslave black people violated democratic principle from the outset which depended on the assumption that all human beings were naturally equal. No democracy is sustainable where the majority is permitted to enslave the minority. Only Douglas's view that black people were not fully human allowed him to call this a democratic decision on slavery. Less obviously, but equally important, Lincoln viewed Douglas as playing a sectional double game. Douglas led Northerners to believe that his popular sovereignty policy was the best way of keeping slavery out of the territories, resulting in more free states. At the same time, Douglas led slave state leaders whose votes he needed to pass the Kansas Nebraska Act in the first place to believe that his popular sovereignty was the best way to introduce slavery to the territories, thereby producing more slave states. To make a long story short, by 1860, it was no longer possible for Stephen Douglas to play this double game. In order to hold off Lincoln's strong challenge for the Illinois U.S. Senate seat in 1858, Douglas effectively promised that territorial legislatures could keep slavery out of the territories. This cost him the slave state support he needed for his 1860 presidential bid. At the 1860 Democratic Convention, Douglas was not willing to say that Congress must legalize slavery in every U.S. territory. That was why slave state delegates walked out and supported Breckinridge instead. So slide eight is the table of results in the 1860 election. Notice here that both Lincoln, and these results, that both Lincoln, the Republican candidate, and Stephen Douglas, the regular Democratic candidate, opposed slaveholders' demand that slavery be legalized in every U.S. territory. Adding Lincoln's popular vote to that of Douglas, this means 70% of voters in 1860 supported candidates that opposed the legalization of slavery in every territory, while only 18%, the Breckinridge popular vote tally, supported that position. The fourth presidential candidate in 1860, John Bell of the newly formed Constitutional Union Party, took no position on slavery, but instead just urged Americans of all sections of the country to support the Constitution and preserve the Union. This was an empty position because people's divisions over how to interpret the Constitution on slavery exactly tracked their divisions over slavery itself. Let's stop talking about slavery accomplishes nothing. Bell received 39 electoral votes and 13% of the popular vote. Those were the circumstances under which Lincoln won the 1860 presidential election. So go to slide nine, which is the preemptively seceding states. Clearly, we already see here a deeply divided country. Yet what followed Lincoln's election? the preemptive secession of seven slave states before Lincoln's inauguration was an extreme and shocking response, even under the deeply divided circumstances of the time. It is true that many slave state leaders had threatened to secede if a Republican president were elected, but actually carrying out such a threat, especially if it risks civil war, is another thing. It also made an important difference under the circumstances 
whether slave states waited until after Lincoln took office to see whether he would commit so-called overt acts against the institution of slavery, which is what Southern critics of secession argued was the proper course of action, to wait and see what he actually does. Or to secede before, or secede before he could take office at all, in which case the act of secession is not directed against any action Lincoln took as president, but instead against the free decision by millions of, decision of, of citizens to vote for him. And indeed, the secession declaration of those seven pre preemptively seceding states made clear that they regarded Northerners' act of voting for Lincoln as itself a great crime justifying the most extreme of remedies. You don't have to think about this too long to realize that secessionists thereby placed themselves in opposition to the democratic process itself. And it, quote, puts us constitutionally in the wrong, as one Georgia critic of secession warned. So let's go to slide 10, which is the slave states that did not secede. Um, is that 10? Go to the, go to the next one. Oh, go, go back up. Uh, there should be a slide with the non-seceding slave states. Well, uh, go, go back. Yeah, I'll just have to take my word for who those states were. <laughs> uh, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas later joined uh, the Confederacy. Oh, okay, right. right. Yes. Um, the fact that preemptive secession was directed against the electoral process itself helps explain why many critically important slaveholding states did not secede from the Union in response to Lincoln's election. In Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas, Secessionist efforts failed to persuade voters that Lincoln's election just by itself was sufficient justification for secession. Those four states joined the Confederacy only after the Confederacy's assault on Fort Sumter in April 1861 pushed them off the fence. Because now, after Fort Sumter, a Union army would be marching through their territory. The slave states of Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri never did join the Confederacy, but instead remained loyal to the Union. Lincoln himself had believed, too optimistically as it turned out, that Northerners and Southerners shared commitment to the principle and practice of free elections would outweigh their disagreements over the rightness or wrongness of slavery. However, Lincoln also judged correctly that if it came to civil war, there would be much stronger political support on the Union side for a war commenced over the slave states' refusal to play by the election rules than by a war initiated by the North as, for the specific purpose of attacking slavery, which was what some abolitionists thought. By the time the Civil War did officially become an abolitionist war on January 1st, 1863, with Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, Northern opinion had shifted fundamentally in an anti-slavery direction as a result of the war itself. But in late 1860 and early 1861, there were many white Northerners who were willing to fight over slaveholders spitting in their eye for how they cast their votes, who would not have been willing at that stage to put their lives on the line to liberate black people from slavery. It's, a, un, it's uh, uncomfortable to say that, but it's, it is a fact. Not the uh, large numbers of people rarely act entirely on altruistic motives. Slave states' refusal to play by the electoral election rules and soon thereafter the assault on Fort Sumter thus gave Lincoln politically a strong hand in the North during the first year of the war. Given how enormously costly and difficult the war became, I do not believe the Union could have won it if from the outset, Lincoln had made it an abolitionist war rather than a war to defend the principle of free elections. Lincoln did want to preserve the Union, but preserving government of, by, and for the people took precedence. During the summer of 1864, when the war was going badly and many people, including Lincoln himself, believed he would lose the 1864 presidential election, some of his supporters urged him to cancel or postpone the elections. Lincoln refused to even consider this because it would betray the very principle for which he was fighting. 
All of this provides necessary context for understanding Lincoln's defense of majority rule in his first inaugural address. That's to what I now turn. So go to slide 11, the first inaugural address. Okay, this is the this is the copy of the first inaugural address as printed in the newspapers of those days. In the first inaugural address, Lincoln acknowledges early that, quote, if by the mere force of numbers, a majority should deprive minority of any clearly written constitutional right, it might, in a moral point of view, justify revolution. As a lifelong admirer of the Declaration of Independence, Lincoln admitted a right of revolution in the event of a, quote, long train of abuses and usurpations. But no such clearly expressed fundamental rights had been violated, certainly not by Lincoln since he had just then taken office. At issue instead, Lincoln argued, were the kind of normal political disagreements, including disagreements about how to interpret the US Constitution itself that are present in all political communities. He provides two specific examples of constitutional disagreements about which the text of the Constitution, quote, does not expressly say. Quote, may Congress prohibit slavery in the territories? The Constitution does not expressly say. Must Congress protect institute slavery in the territories? The Constitution does not expressly say. You may recall that these were precisely the two major questions over which the 1860 presidential election was contested. May Congress prohibit slavery in the territories? On this question, Lincoln and his party answered yes. Stephen Douglas and John Breckinridge answered no. Must Congress protect slavery in the territories? On this question, Breckinridge had answered yes. Both Lincoln and Douglas had answered no. Recall that the only pre presidential candidate to take this position, that Congress must protect slavery in the territories, Breckinridge, had received only 18% of the popular vote and 24% of the electoral vote. And it was this specific policy, Congress must legalize slavery in every federal territory, North and South, that secessionists demanded, failing which they would break up the Union and prepare for war. This immediately after posing these two slavery related disagreements upon which, quote, the Constitution does not expressly say that Lincoln provides his central defense of majority rule, which I will quote here at length. Quote, from questions of this class spring all our constitutional controversies, and we divide upon them into majorities and minorities. If the minority will not acquiesce, the majority must or the government must cease. There is no other alternative, for continuing the government is acquiescence on one side or the other. If a minority in such case will secede rather than acquiesce, they make a precedent which will in turn divide and ruin them. For a minority of their own will secede from them whenever a majority refuses to be controlled by such minority. For instance, why may not any portion of a new confederacy a year or two hence arbitrarily secede again, precisely as portions of the present union now claim to secede from it? All who cherish disunion sentiments are now being educated to the exact temper of doing this. Is there such perfect identity of interest among the states to compose a new union as to produce harmony only and to prevent renewed secession? Plainly, the central idea of secession is the essence of anarchy. A majority held in restraint by constitutional checks and limitations, and always changing easily with deliberate changes of popular opinions and sentiments, is the only true sovereign of a free people. That's where I got the title of my book. Whoever rejects it does of necessity fly to anarchy or to despotism. Unanimity is impossible. The rule of a minority as a permanent arrangement is wholly inadmissible. So that rejecting the majority principle, anarchy or despotism in some form is all that is left. I wanna make several observations here about Lincoln's defense of majority rule. First, neither here nor anywhere else did Lincoln argue that majorities can do no wrong, that the will of the majority is always just, that the voice of the majority is the voice of God or anything of the 
In calling the majority sovereign, Lincoln meant only that in any form of government, if dissent into anarchy is to be prevented, the final resolution of disputed questions, the power of sovereignty, must be placed somewhere. And that placing it in the majority is better than placing it in some privileged, powerful minority. For minorities, too, can act and can and do act unjustly. If a majority in power acts, unjust, acts unjustly, you can vote it out and replace it with a different majority. But a powerful privileged minority, whether it be the class of slaveholders or the US Supreme Court, cannot be voted out. Placing sovereignty in a potentially changing majority, Lincoln's own word, is safer and more just than placing it anywhere else. Second observation, to function as the sovereign of a free people, a majority must be, quote, held in restraint by constitutional checks and limitations. Majority cannot do literally anything that it wants. That would be mob rule, which Lincoln, from the earliest years of his political career, feared could cause American democracy to commit suicide. A majority to function legitimately as sovereign must form and act in accordance with constitutionally specified processes, which include regularly scheduled elections, rights to freedom of speech and press, and more. Lincoln's electoral college majority and the anti-slavery majority he hoped to build over time in Congress and the electorate was a constitutionally formed, constitutionally checked majority. Secession, in contrast, in forcibly dividing the country in response to unfavorable election results was not, in Lincoln's view, a constitutionally authorized process. Third observation, in his defense of majority rule, Lincoln did not claim that he himself or the Republican platform of prohibiting slavery in the territories already enjoyed clear majority support. Lincoln knew that he had been elected by a plurality, not a majority of the American voters. And though the Republican Party had received the largest share of seats in the House and Senate, it remained short of a congressional majority until secession removed much of the opposition. But Lincoln surely recognized from the 1860 election results that there was a very large national majority against the position that Congress must legalize slavery in every US territory. That's why Breckinridge only got 18%. Though the election results did not yet indicate a majority for the Republican position of prohibiting slavery in every US territory, Lincoln's 40% was close enough that it was reasonable for him to hope and believe that a stable majority could be secured in support of this stance in the not distant future. He believed such a majority was within range. So did the secessionists. They would not have broken up the Union and invited civil war unless they thought Lincoln's stance on slavery in the territories was within range of becoming national policy. Fourth observation, in calling the majority the only true sovereign of a free people, i.e. the ultimate power to decide contested questions, including constitutional questions, Lincoln made clear that he did not regard the U.S. Supreme Court is the absolute and final judge of constitutional questions. For Chief Justice's Taney in Taney's opinion, the Dred Scott case did effectively declare itself as having spoken the final word on the Constitution and slavery. In effect, and many others have made this observation, the Dred Scott ruling was a directive to the Republican Party to disband. Lincoln did not call for extra legal resistance to Supreme Court decisions. He emphasized that the court's ruling in any particular case had to be respected. But he believed and hoped that uh, decisions like the, that bad decisions like the Dred Scott case could be reversed over time if the precedent could be kept as narrow as possible and as presidents change the court's makeup over time through appointments. In this sense, ordinary voters in a democracy do and should have continuing input on important constitutional questions. Otherwise, as Lincoln said in the address, quote, if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court the instant they are made, then, quote, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, 
having to that extent resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. If in Lincoln's view, the US Supreme Court cannot legitimately claim to be the American people's ultimate sovereign, even less could an individual state claim to be the ultimate sovereign judge of constitutional questions. And yet that was the argument underlying the doctrine of secession, that each individual state, because it was quote, a sovereign state, was the final judge for itself of its own rights and obligations under the US Constitution. You could then have as many final interpretations of the Constitution as there were states in the Union. No matter that the Constitution, though it does say that states have rights and duties, nowhere calls them sovereign in any sense. Part of being a sovereign state is interpreting the Constitution any way you want to. According to this sovereign state theory, states could nullify any federal laws they didn't agree with, and if they chose, secede from the Union for any reason they liked. Moreover, according to this state sovereign theory, if a state chose to secede from the union, the union itself was obliged by their own hitherto shared constitution to let that state go in peace and not resist the act of secession in any way. In practice, a theory of this kind, as Lincoln saw it, encouraged states and especially slave owners to extort whatever they could get out of national policy by threatening to break up the country and trigger civil war if they didn't get exactly what they wanted. American history would have played out very differently if Lincoln had, brought, had bought into the theory that individual states were complete and final sovereign. Obviously, he did not. Lincoln did recognize that ours is a federal system with governmental powers divided between national, state, and local governments. Contrary to what some of his critics claim, Lincoln did not seek to concentrate all power in the national government. In his first inaugural address, he recognized the melancholy but undeniable re reality that under the constitution, as president, he had, quote, no lawful right to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. But in fact, none of the contested slavery questions driving the conflict could accurately be described as state's rights and the sense of a state's authority to govern matters within its own boundaries. The status of slavery in federal territories not yet state was clearly a national question. Citizens of every state had a stake one way or the other in how this question was decided. The same was true for the district slavery in the District of Columbia where we are right now over which the Constitution gives governing jurisdiction to Congress. And yet, when slaveholders demanded the right to bring and keep their slaves while transiting or temporarily residing in a slave state, if anything, it was the free states that could claim states' rights high ground and refusing to permit this. This is actually, this is, Lincoln believed this was one of the ways in which slavery could be effectively nationalized by slaveholders bringing their enslaved enslaved human property into free states and say, I'm only temporarily passing through for a few years. These were in view, Lincoln's view national questions to be legitimately decided by a national majority in accordance with the rules and processes set forth in the United States Constitution. For it perverts the notion of states' rights for a South Carolina slaveholder to claim that because he has a legal right to hold a human being in slavery everywhere inside South Carolina, he has a right to hold that human being in slavery nearly everywhere outside South Carolina as well. But that is indeed how defenders of slavery understood slaves, states' rights as a legal entitlement they could carry anywhere they went. Slave state leaders for decades have threatened secession whenever any anti-slavery measures, no matter how modest, were discussed in Congress. Lincoln viewed secession threats as a deliberate strategy whereby a powerful minority seeks to impose its favored policies despite being outvoted in elections. For decades, the slave power had almost always gotten their way in this matter. But faced with secessions and threats of secession in the aftermath of the 1860 election, Lincoln dug in his heels. He was willing to retreat on some points in hopes of forestalling civil war but he was not willing to retreat from the stance on pro prohibiting slavery in the territories 
despite enormous pressure from many leaders north and south to do this. <laughs> from Lincoln's perspective, it fundamentally subverted the practice of free elections. If those who lose an election can get everything they want, would have gotten by winning that election simply by threatening secession, violence, and civil war unless their demands are met. Lincoln was convinced, for example, that if he and his party caved on this point, they would soon face demands to annex Cuba as a new slave state and additional slave empire expansion in Central and South America. Lincoln wanted very much to avoid civil war, but not at the price of allowing the country to be ruled by those, those who just lost the election. On this point, he was willing to fight. So go to slide 12, slide 12 now. Given the long and deadly war that ensued, someone might be inclined to ask, why not just let the Southern states go in peace? Even if they had no constitutional right to secede, was it worth a war? No one on either side anticipated the length and extent of the war that followed. And slave state leaders might have thought twice about assaulting Fort Sumter if they knew its result would be the rapid and complete abolition of slavery. But the truth is that peaceful secession was not in the cards. Even if Lincoln or some other president in his place had decided not to resist secession and the Confederacy's independence was acknowledged in practice, this would not have prevented war. It would have moved, it would, instead, it would have shifted the war westward and technically changed it from a civil to an international war. For the Confederate states, having seceded from the Union and risked civil war rather than allow slavery to be shut out of the Western territories, were certainly not going to peacefully hand all those same Western territories over to the Union. They certainly aimed to annex all of New Mexico territory, which included the future states of New Mexico and Arizona. The Confederacy also planned to send an army to California to aid a pro-slavery secessionist movement that aimed at severing Southern California from the rest of the state to form a new slave state out of Southern California. Pro-slavery leaders believed California was perfectly suited to slave plantations, and they may have been right. After this, all the major rivers and bays that bounded and, or traversed both free and slave states, border states like Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland that would have had their own internal civil wars over slavery, the Confederacy, Confederacy's aim to expand their slave empire southward into the Caribbean and Central America and more. We cannot say for certain how such a war would have played out but peaceful side-by-side -side coexistence was extremely unlikely. As Lincoln observed in this inaugural address, quote, physically speaking, we cannot separate. We cannot remove our respective sections from each other nor build an impassable wall between them. Two separate nations would continue to face, quote, the identical old questions with even less hope of resolving them peacefully after separation than before. And it's also essential to point out the obvious that formally recognizing the Confederacy's independence would have rendered the situation of millions of enslaved men and women even more hopeless than before. Defenders of Southern secession, and yes, they are still around, believed that Southerners had an unquestionable right to secede if they simply chose no longer be, to be part of the United States. Isn't that what consent of the government is all about? Go to slide 13 now. The next slide. The consent of the governed for secessionists meant consent for white Southerners, not the race they held in bondage. Secessionists simply erased Black people from the principle of consent. And the same is true of defenders of the lost cause today. By any fair interpretation of consent of the governed, the enslaved men and women of the South would have had even more right to secede, so to speak, from the slave owners, to do so violently if necessary, and to invite the support of any allies they could find in that effort, including Lincoln and the Union Army. This is in fact what happened when hundreds of thousands of black men enlisted in the Union Army in, in the Civil War and played an essential role in winning the war 
abolishing slavery and saving the union, and in Lincoln's view of restoring the principle of government by free elections and majority rule. To return to the central theme of Lincoln elections and majority rule, Lincoln recognized that all political communities harbor disagreements, sometimes very deep ones. In the United States, this was no less true within states than between them. If a state can secede from the union because it doesn't like the election results, then why couldn't a county secede from a state for the same reason? Or a township secede from a county? Secession might be justified on the basis of serious, sustained, documented violations of fundamental rights. But as a response to ordinary policy disagreements, secession was a formula for anarchy, violence, and despotism. Free elections and majority rule were, in Lincoln's view, the only peaceful way to resolve or at least contain such disagreements. He may ultimately have been wrong in believing that even the great injustice of slavery could have been peacefully remedied in the United States. But I believe he had a moral duty to make the effort rather than settle for either the full nationalization and perpetuation of slavery on one side or the terrible path of war on the other. His first inaugural address was his final plea for a peaceful resolution. Suppose the secession crisis had been peacefully resolved, how then did Lincoln imagine a gradual, peaceful, democratic extinction of slavery playing out? I can't go into this now, but I'm happy to address it in Q&A. There were several political and constitutional tools Lincoln and other Republicans could and would have used to put the squeeze on slavery politically geographically and economically. Even more important, Lincoln believed that national public opinion could be fundamentally shifted against slavery if a major political party, and specifically the newly formed Republican Party, took a series of small anti-slavery steps, each of them rewarded by voters over several election cycles. There are some undeniable justice problems with a gradual extinction of slavery. If you were an enslaved person, you want your freedom now, not 30 years in the future. But the only way that slavery could have been quickly abolished in the United States was the way in which it was actually abolished by military force in a war costing hundreds of thousands of lives. Lincoln was not willing to make a war of this kind until secession is forced it on him. Lincoln before the war was also unable to imagine a post-slavery America as a genuinely multiracial democracy with equal civil and political rights for all. Not because he believed black Americans were incapable of being responsible citizens, but because he believed the vast majority of white Americans would never accept full equality. Only at the end of the war, after hundreds of thousands of black men had served in the military, did Lincoln publicly endorse voting rights for African Americans. This may have been the final straw for John Wilkes Booth, who was present at this speech and assassinated him three days later. In closing, I want to address briefly the contemporary significance of my central point, that the triggering event of the Civil War was a powerful minority's un unwillingness to respect the results of an election that did not go their way. The book from which my presentation is adapted, I had begun writing as early as 2010. I had a complete manuscript almost ready to submit for publication when the January 6, 2021 assault on the US Capitol took place. Well before that date, I had observed in my public presentations on Lincoln that our political climate was more polarized, toxic, and unstable than any time since the 1850s, and that decade didn't end well. My final revision of the manuscript was done after the January 6, 2021 insurrection, the aim of which was to halt the constitutionally prescribed tabulation of electoral votes in Congress, and thereby unconstitutionally to keep in office an incumbent president who had lost the 2020 presidential election. So let's go to the next slide. 1861 and 2021 thus entered the history books as the two years in which a major disruption of the democratic process had been, quote, formidably attempted to borrow a phrase from Lincoln's inaugural address, by powerful actors dissatisfied with the election results. We know how the 1861 crisis played out. The political crisis triggered on January 6, 2021 is still with us, 
we are by no means past it. There are some obvious differences between the secessionists of 1861 and the insurrectionists of 2021. The, in, the secessionists of 1861 did not invent a stolen election fable to justify their act. Instead, they frankly acknowledged that they simply refused to be governed by a president whose views differed so radically from their own. Nor did the secessionists of, eight, of, eight, of 1861 claim the right to continue ruling the nation whose election results it refused to accept. They demanded only to separate from that nation. In these respects, the election rejectors of 1861 were more principled than the election rejectors of 2021. What the two, two cases have in common, however, was their dramatic refusal to play by shared democratic rules rules that hitherto had been accepted by all parties and political actors of any significance, despite deep disagreements on policy. Unless citizens with deeply opposed views can agree to play by a shared set of political rules, democracy becomes impossible and is replaced by warfare. And indeed, increasing number of Americans today, especially on the political right, but evident at both ends of this political spectrum, regard the resort to political violence as legitimate. I believe we are at a very dangerous, unstable, and unpredictable moment in our politics today. I also believe it will require enormous and sustained effort by people coming from multiple points on the political compass to navigate our democracy safely through this storm. I don't want to, it, I don't want to end on this negative note, however, but on a positive. In Lincoln's time, many Americans had given up on the democratic process, not only on the pro-slavery side, but also many abolitionists. Some abolitionists called for the free states to secede from the slave states, which of course was structurally identical to what the slave states did in 1861, and which would have done nothing to overthrow slavery. Others entertained exaggerated hopes for John Brown type anti-slavery guerrilla war. Uh, go to slide 15. Lincoln himself did not give up on the democratic process, neither before the war nor during it. When war was forced upon him by those who refused to respect the democratic process, he made it a central war aim, as he phrased it in his July 4th, 1861 message to Congress, quote, to demonstrate to the world that when ballots have fairly and constitutionally decided there can be no successful appeal back to bullets, that there can be no successful appeal except the ballots themselves at succeeding elections. For me, what is most inspiring about Lincoln's life and words is that amid a titanic clash of social, economic, and political forces that led many of his compatriots to despair of doing anything about slavery and others to preemptive violence, he kept his faith in the promise of democratic institutions. The session and civil war did not prove that votes don't matter. Instead, the events following the 1860 election demonstrated that sometimes votes can matter so much that powerful people resort to extreme measures to nullify the results. Let us today trust that our democratic institutions, flawed as they are, can be employed by men and women of good faith to address our most urgent challenges, among them <clears throat> ensuring the future of American democracy itself. Thank you. Thank you. It is our tradition to uh, take questions yeah. first from students. So I'm going to let you. Uh, Try to tell who's a student and who's not. Okay. Everybody's a student, <laughs> student of life. Questions? Yes, go ahead. Um, I thought the lecture was incredibly fascinating, but one thing that I wasn't like that familiar with um, prior to hearing the lecture was the sort of divide between um, the sort of like Douglas faction and the Breckenridge faction in terms of how to approach slavery. Yeah. Um, I was wondering since. Uh, Douglas Hyde um, saw it, that it should be like the decision of the white um, people within each state. Each well, state and territory. Yeah. yeah. And um, the Breckenridge uh, <laughs> faction that um, 
it should be done with sort of like nationally in terms of yeah. like all of it should be improved. Right, that the Breckenridge, Breckenridge's position is that Congress should affirmatively legalize slavery in every, for every federal territory. Yeah. So I was wondering that during um, the Civil War, did the Confederate government have more of like, in terms of its internal structure, a more of like a confederal system in terms of each state managing its own affairs, mm -hmm. or was there greater centralized authority under Jefferson Davis's cabinet and the legislature? It was um, that you know this is something that a lot of scholars write about. Um, it was somewhat more decentral decentralized. Some scholars of the Civil War think this was part of the problem of the Confederacy in fighting the war that they had uh, a less effective uh, central government. Uh, they had a less, they had a, they had a weaker uh, federal union than the than the union did, um, and uh, interestingly enough, though the Confederacy uh, did not include a right of secession, which if some people think, oh, they just forgot to include it, it was so obvious. No, actually, if you're trying to create a new nation, they could not have been indifferent to one of those, one of their their states deciding to switch sides and they would not have let, you know, Tennessee switch sides and go back over to the Union. So um, there were, uh, I will also say too, there were um, neither Abraham Lincoln nor Jefferson Davis were dictators. Neither, in both cases, they ran into substantial opposition that they had to overcome. That's also part of the picture. Um, many people think that it was the leadership styles of Jefferson Davis and Lincoln that made a bigger difference that Lincoln was able to, people could insult him and, and just say horrible things about him, but as long as they still were able to accomplish something or win a battle, he would look the other way. And Jefferson Davis was not like that. He took criticism very personally and often came close to getting into duels with people. So there's, there's a, a I think everyone agrees, that most scholars of the Civil War agreed that the Confederacy was less effective as a political unit. On the other side of it, to win that kind of a war, um, which really needs to be a war of, of conquest and occupation, is very difficult. So other things being equal, the Confederacy, I think, had the uh, advantage in the war and only um, much better leadership on Lincoln's part um, could have won it. Yes, uh, go ahead. You, you're in the seminar. You asked some yeah. good questions in the yeah. seminar. Uh, I'm going to have my vote on that. So in your presentation today and in the discussion before, you hone in on an aspect of the inaugural address of Lincoln's view that the Supreme Court had influence on, um, on national matters, but he thought that the final word was the popular sovereignty yes. of the people. So I guess in modern times, the Supreme Court, similar issue is going on whether the Supreme Court has some final say or not, um, or is, is the popular sovereignty more should come from the people. What do you think Lincoln would say today in regards of, um, of methods such as court packing uh -huh. and these kind of things from the, from the president being elected from the people and the Supreme Court not being elected? So, so the, the, the question is about, since Lincoln said, uh, and I read out this passage, uh, that the Supreme Court cannot be the sovereign. They cannot have the final word in every important question. The question was, what, what would Lincoln say today about the role of the Supreme Court? Uh, I think he would say the same thing today that he said then, that Lincoln was never comfortable with the idea of any Supreme Court, uh, especially unelected Supreme Court, having not just a say, but claiming the final say and uh, that in, in a way that can never be reopened on every important political question. I think things like the court packing ideas, those even come up because the Supreme Court is so powerful. So, um, and, you know, in a certain way, Supreme Court, I mean, uh, unfortunately, we settled into this kind of politics where on both sides of the political spectrum, in a sense, both sides want the Supreme Court to have the final word if it's their word, right? Rather than trusting it to the electoral process and trusting that the electoral process may, you know, may uh, 
you may get an answer one time and it may change in the next election, but that's what Lincoln would have favored. I can't imagine him, um, I can't imagine Lincoln saying that the abortion issue should be decided either way, finally and completely by the Supreme Court. I think in, I, you know, I don't have any evidence of what he thought about the issue itself, but I know a lot of that, there's a lot in what he thought about the power of the Supreme Court. And um, so I guess I would say, you know, Lincoln probably would say today, same as what he said then, uh, it should be up to the people through a series of elections and deliberate processes connected with those elections to decide on an ongoing basis, even things like what is the meaning of our shared constitution? Yes. But just out of curiosity, you call it that point. How would that work in today's society where like in Congress and the, the presidency, they're very inefficient at passing laws that perhaps people want. So the Supreme Court has established rights, like the, the Bill of Rights has been moved to the states, right? It's been incorporated. So how would how would people vote to get more rights or expand rights if the Supreme Court can establish those? And right now, everything through popular sovereignty is a very, very, very slow process. Yeah. So the question is, um, let me see if I can restate this, that um, part of the reason for the court having such a prominent role is that Congress seems to be such an ineffective body and ineffective and slow. And right now we don't even have a House of Representatives um, as an organized body. Um, so, um, and I think, I think you could argue that part of the reason why the court has acquired this greater power is because Congress has abdicated. It, it has abdicated its responsibility as an effective governing body. That's not a justification necessarily for that excessive power, but I think that's how it's happened. And um, the, I will say too, that happened in Lincoln's time. The, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which banned Slave, that which opened slavery to the territories basically said it was Congress saying to itself, we will now prevent ourselves from deciding this important question. So that was a self-inflicted wound. Lincoln was aware of ways and, and then the, the Dred Scott case was another mortal, potentially mortal, mortal blow at the power of Congress. Lincoln's response was to try to resurrect the power of Congress, to resurrect Congress as a viable, relevant, deliberative, effective body. Um, and I guess I would say if he were around today, he would say that too, how you can do it, I don't know. Let's, let's, if he knows how to do that, I would really love to know because I'm so, this is among my greatest frustrations that I, I, do, I, I do think many of the things that are done by the Supreme Court ought to be done by Congress. But if Congress is, uh, continually stripping itself of any uh, functioning, it's almost inevitable that some of that power is going to flow to other branches. Yes, go ahead. So you mentioned at the end of your talk um, the contested 20, um, 2020 election between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. So looking at these two vastly different political instances, in two times where you've seen major political factions with huge ideological differences, do you think that this is a symptom of a larger issue of our electoral process and the way that our democracy is structured? Um, I'm not asking if you're a yeah. revisionist or anything yeah. like that, just generally, what do you think the solution to this is? Because it seems to be, I guess, do you think it's a pattern? And then if you do, what would be the ideal resolution that would preserve democratic process? So the question is in, in the, in the, uh, in sort of the comparing 1861 with 2021, um, and the, the chaos in both of those cases, is there some different kind of reform of the electoral process that might have helped? Is something like that? Um, I guess I would have to say that if, if you see the other side, not as fellow citizens, but as enemies, as like as foreign enemies, then no, there's no election rules you can write that will resolve that. You have to begin by saying, are we gonna have a set of rules that 
I think for Lincoln, he would have said really almost any set of electoral rules that we can agree upon is better than having no rules or having rules that you tear up as soon as they don't go your way. Um, so, uh, you know, there are people who have sort of engaged in, in thought experiments about the 1860 election, about whether a different set of election rules might have elected Stephen Douglas or John Bell. Um, that's possible. Um, no set of plausible election rules would have elected John Breckinridge because he had such an extreme minority position. Uh, but so Lincoln, um, I think Lincoln recognized there were different kinds of election rules. States had different election rules than the federal government. Um, he, he tended to favor election rules. I would say this, he, he favored election rules that got us down to a, to a clear vote between two options. Um, the problem with, you know, if you're voting at three or four different positions, then uh, you don't know, then it's, it's very easy to not have a majority at all. And Lincoln understood that as a problem. I know that the advocates of ranked voting thinks that we can get around that maybe, I don't know what he would have thought of that, but um, he certainly did not like the idea of having lots of parties competing for elections in the general election, because then you have the kind of fragmentation that you saw in the 1860 election. Um, but most of all, any set of rules, any set of rules requires seeing people as fellow citizens rather than enemies. Yes, to, uh, a couple students right uh, with the the sort of sports shirt and then the guy behind him. Okay. Um, so my question is somewhat similar. Uh, I, I remember you said uh, you had submitted your manuscript before mm -hmm. uh, January 6th happened. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to ask, I'm always interested in like kind of like the historiography of like how the current era shapes thinking of the past. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask, did January 6th make you reflect differently on the book as it had already been written or like that time period? Well, um, I will first answer that. And the question is, did the January 6th uh, event cause me to reflect differently? And the answer is yes, but along tracks that I was already following in my mind. Like I can tell, I started working in this book actively in 2009, 2010. By 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, it was clear we were in, heading to me that we were heading towards some sort of a crisis. I just couldn't have said what it was, what it was going to be. But it felt like for somebody who lived, who studied the 1850s, it was already seeming like the 1850s through the middle 2010s. Um, but did, um, I would say uh, the how it actually, the dramatic way in which it was actually rejection of an election, I think caused me to, um, what I said at the beginning about how this, I think should change the way we think about the Civil War. Yes, it was about slavery, but it was immediately, a, the fact that it started in, in refusing to respect election results stamped that event from the beginning. I think that the January 6, 2021 assault on the Capitol helped me bring out and emphasize that point that was already, I think, implicit in my story, but I hadn't really thought about it so systematically. And, um, and so, and it also I have to say, um, having lived, having studied this, the, this period, Lincoln's period, and and then gone through January 6, 2021, which I think is still with us, it does make me think how fragile our commitment to democratic rules are. And so I guess in a way that event has made me in talking about the Lincoln book and in that kind of an evangelist for let's recommit to the democratic process. We can't take it for granted anymore. Yes. Um, so kind of off, a little bit off topic question. Um, you talked a lot about how slavery was really, or the or the Civil War in general was only going to be like 
decided based off some kind of violent or some kind of confrontation. Uh, my question to you is that- That some people think this, yes. many people argue that. Yes. Yeah. Um, my question to you is, do you think that the Compromise of 1850 helped possibly um, steer the states towards a peaceful solution or fan the flames of war? Um, yes. <laughs> so, so the question was, did the 1850 compromise steer country toward a peaceful solution or help fan the flames of war? I think it did both of those things. And people who write on that will sort of disagree about exactly the kind of question that you asked, you know, whether whether the 1850 compromise was really already the secession of 1860 with it with just a sort of slow delay. Um, or whether that was <clears throat> genuinely a union saving compromise that was then, unra then unraveled by later acts. So one of, the, uh, and one of the things that Lincoln points out is, is that Stephen Douglas's um, Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854 completely over unraveled the settlement that had made in 1850. And so, and, and you could say, with the, at least with the, the settlement of 1850, because you had, there were all these new territories that had been gained from the Mexican War, which Lincoln opposed in the first place, something had to be done about those, some decision had to be made about those territories. Nothing required uh, Stephen Douglas to um, repeal the Missouri Compromise and the, and the North River Restriction uh, on the spread of slavery, other than he needed Southerners' votes in order to pass that, that law. Uh, go ahead, Tom. So, so I'm speaking on, on behalf of Zoom land. All right, Zoom land. Have many, many friends. Okay. Uh, mostly people went to graduate school with you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, David Fott uh, has several questions. I'm just going to ask one. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad that David Fott, that, David, had been meaning to tell you about this book. I'm glad. <laughs> <you guys. laughs> uh, wasn't Lincoln savvy enough to expect Southern states to secede? Could he have really expected to avoid civil war before if we won? Or, or after his election, or was he trying to be sure that blame fell upon the South? Well, that is another interpretation that um, is held by people that I know, <laughs> people that I have been and will be on panels with, <laughs> um, people that you may hear from in subsequent uh, um, installments of this series, um, that Lincoln really, this is an interpretation that I don't share, but it's out there that Lincoln really knew and expected civil war all along. And that uh, all the things that seemed to be um, his making heroic efforts to preserve the peace while also still being anti-slavery were really for the purpose of putting the North in a better position when war came. Um, you know, I think you can read the story either way, uh, especially since the same things that from Lincoln's point of view would have preserved the peace also uh, gave more legitimacy to the union if it came to war. But I just think there's so much in Lincoln that um, can't be explained uh, if he thought he was that war was inevitable. He really seems to have believed that time discussion in the ballot box could address even the most difficult questions, I think. And, and that's central to his seeing the Civil War as a test of um, government of the people by the people for the people, because you know, otherwise government of the people by the people for the people, if all it leads to his violence on most, the most important questions, it's a failure. He did not want to see democracy as a failure. So that's why I think it is core belief. Lincoln wanted to believe it could have been done peacefully. Um, I also would say that, you know, if you want to look at some comparisons, in the 1970s, early 1980s, everybody said uh, South Africa is headed for a, a violent meltdown. That's there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people killed in a racial civil war in, in uh, South Africa. I would even suggest that that was the more likely outcome in South Africa. It was averted because of Nelson Mandela's leadership. So, you know, the less likely outcome 
can sometimes be achieved. I, I think that maybe Lincoln recognized that civil war over slavery was the more likely outcome, but he still hoped to, to avert that. And so that makes it not pointless. It makes it, you know, deeply tragic, but it, you know, trying to avoid, trying to seriously address slavery while, while avoiding a horrific civil war, I take seriously that Lincoln really did both want to uh, gradually abolish slavery and avoid civil war. Do we have more on? We do. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Go all right. So th this is from um, Diana Chow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and uh, she has two questions. I'm going to leave aside the one where she praises you. Okay. All right. <laughs> Just for the audience, so the speaker here is coming in November. So, right. So, so say hello to Diana. Okay. Um, so Diana, Diana, thank you for joining us virtually. Yeah. Um, while I fully agree with you, this is Diana. While I fully agree with you about the disgraceful mob rule aspect of January 6, isn't there a significant difference between the Trumpist claim and the secessionist claim? Doesn't the Trumpist claim acknowledge the rightness of the majority rule? They claim wrongly that Trump won the election. Still, that grants legitimacy as majority rule. The secessionists assert the right of the minority to reject the results of a perfectly mm -hmm. constitutional election. Uh, so the question is whether the Trumpists really still believe in majority rule. They just believe in the majority of their own imagination. Um, that, that's my way, that's not Diane's way of putting it, but that's that's my way of putting Diana's point. Um, you know, I think, I would say, I would suggest that actually they don't believe in majority rule for anyone other than themselves. If you only believe it for yourself, you don't believe in it at all. Um, so, um, if you if you see the footage of the um, the video footage taken from inside the the January sixth uh, assault on the Capitol, um, it's clear that they see the Democrats, Nancy Pelosi, Obama, everybody as purely and simply enemies. That that there is, and I could you. you see, under no circumstances, and under any systematic counting of votes, even if you demonstrated them 100%, would that change their, their in the slightest? Because they just saw those people as enemies and you don't turn your government over to your enemies. Um, I mean, if you take another example, so the claim that the Vice President of the United States, they, they demanded that Mike Pence uh, use his supposed authority as Vice President to, to uh, declare his own judgment of the count and declare his ticket to win. Does that mean they really believe the vice president has his authority? They're not going to turn it over to Kamala Harris. They just mean that if our vice president can do that, do it. So that's why I say I don't see this as really a principled, um, any kind of, you know, principled commitment to majority rule, but just kind of laxness on what counts as fraud which that's there too. But I think if you show by apps, if, if the voice of God came down and told them that Joe Biden has legitimately won the election, they would have said, we're still at war with them because we think they're godless. That's kind of a long question, but I, a long answer, but I, I really don't see the, the January 6th insurrectionists as in any principled way committed to majority except if they, unless they win. Yes. So going off more about kind of the January 6th up, um, one could argue that January, the January 6th insurrection was in a way our generation's attack on, on Fort Sumter after, after, of course, Biden's election. And if the attack on the fort led to civil war, how can we prevent another escalation into some level of civil war, especially if Trump loses again in 2024? And how do we instill a, a trust in the American electoral process for those who participated in January 6th and or continue to support Trump after the riot and his many indictments? So the question is how after January 6th do we restore trust in the democratic process? For the most part. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, that's a great question. I, I think about that every day. Um, so, um, 
I, I guess I would say um, that enough people see that event is wrong that they don't want to see it repeated. Even if they don't agree about what the election results were, they see that that event was wrong. And I think they would see, if you think about it, that that is really democracy committing suicide, which, which Lincoln uh, feared from the earliest years of his career. So maybe if you can get an agreement and then, no, even if we disagree on everything else, even if we disagree about how to count votes, we ought to be able to agree that that's wrong. What happened there was wrong and let's and not happen again. Uh, I, I would settle for that as a good beginning. More questions from the, okay, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, you, well, I was gonna ask, do you have a view on like the 1860 political economy and what maybe drove those states to succeeding outside of the electoral pressure? I mean, special interest or just a view of that? Well, of course, you know, slave, slavery was the greatest of all special interests. I mean, they, um, the political economy behind, the, there is an important political economy behind the slavery expansion to the territory issues, which is that if the, if the Republican Party succeeds in banning slavery from the territories, even if, he doesn't, even if they don't interfere with slavery in the states where it actually exists, as a slaveholder, your property takes an immediate hit because it's no longer as portable as it was. So that, that was by far their most important investment. So in, the, it, so in that sense, it, part of the Republican strategy of squeezing slavery out of, exist, out of existence was what we would today call an economic sanctions policy. And that that's has a real important political economy element to it. It's also the case that slavery had to have high profits. Now we, we think of capitalism as you know everybody needs high profits. No, slavery really needed to have high profits because it was such a dangerous institution that because there's always the danger of a slave insurrection, even at least on a local level, even if it doesn't succeed, it can be very deadly for the people in that area. And so only the high profits of slavery um, in a sense bought off what would otherwise be Genuine concerns about is this is this institution safe for the white people living in the neighborhood, and so that's why that was another reason why <clears throat> slaveholders thought, well, you know, we have to keep expanding because we have to keep slavery as possible. <laughs> so that's there's lots of real interesting um, elements of the political economy of slavery. It was also a, a global, not just a national. It was, a, it was part of the global economy, global capitalist economy. We have time for one more question. Okay. It will be from Zoom. So this is uh, from Derek Webb. Uh, okay. Our friend is now at Yale Law okay. School. Um, if the natural rights philosophy of the Declaration of Independence is the, quote, apple gold for which the U.S. Constitution is the frame of silver, yeah. in Lincoln's phrasing, isn't the most fundamental legitimating rule for American law and politics, the rights of individuals, natural and constitutional, rather than majority rule, majority will? Mm -hmm. If so, shouldn't counter -major majoritarian institutions like the Supreme Court have a decisive role as a lawyer's question? Yeah. Have a decisive role in constitutional attacking <laughs> majority will? And if not, what other institution could be better situated to protect the rights of all the people? Um, so I would say, well, so the question is about whether, there's, there's two parts of that question, counter-majoritarian practices and whether they should have a decisive role and who should have a decisive role. Lincoln clearly, in, that, in the passage, in Lincoln's defense of majority rule, talks about constitutional checks and limitations. And I think he understood that courts had to have a role in monitoring those constitutional checks and limitations. I mean, even, even if you want to put your trust in elections, somebody has to monitor the elections and courts play an essential role in that. Um, I think that the problem from Lincoln's point of view it was the decisive part in that, um, I think for Lincoln, you, want, you created the counter-majoritarian institutions so that over time, the, the uh, majority could correct its own mistake. The decisive rule, which is like people who want the Supreme Court to step in, 
don't trust the majority to correct its mistakes. And, but then some people don't trust the Supreme Court to correct its mistakes. So there you have it. So I think the, 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 the decisive part, I think, is what Lincoln would, uh, uh, kind of majoritarian, yes, decisive and final, no. Well, I, I hope a decisive majority of the room will uh, join me in thanking you. Thank you very much.